Tourism. This is Science Mail. How do you read? Over. Roger. Science Mail coming in loud and clear. Go ahead. All right. Ready to review today's mission. You'll be docking at the hydrogen ball launcher for an experiment with explosive chemistry. Then rendezvous with astronaut Tom Henrichs at approximately 11.04 MET. Roger. Reviewing files for Colonel Hendricks now. See that Tom flew uh, four missions during the space shuttle program. He spent 40 days in Earth's orbit. Impressive. Roger that. Tom is also a friend of the science mill and a board member. Tell him I say hi. Explorer zone, prepare to set course for the hydrogen ball launcher. Over. Roger, preparing to set course for the hydrogen ball launcher. Joel, I've been looking everywhere for that stapler. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Explorer Zone. As you saw, this week's episode is out of this world and features a very special guest, astronaut Tom Hendricks. Tom was part of NASA's shuttle program, which is currently retired. These days, astronauts spend most of their time on the International Space Station, the ISS. There are three astronauts on the ISS right now studying how gravity affects the human body. Here at the Science Mill, we have our own gravity-defying exhibit that's powered by chemistry. This is our hydrogen ball launcher. The machine turns electrical energy into chemical energy using a process called electrolysis. We start the reaction by pumping a direct electric current through an electrolyte. The current separates the water into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen gas collects here in the combustion chamber. The remaining electrical energy is transferred into chemical energy when it ignites the gas creating a blast that can launch a ping pong ball. Let's try it out and see what electrolysis looks like in action. You can see the data created by the reaction in our LabVIEW monitor. This shows how the electrons flow through and break down the water molecules to create energy for the reaction. Electrolysis is currently used on the International Space Station to create oxygen for the astronauts to breathe. By splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen, astronauts can use the oxygen created to sustain life and repurpose the hydrogen back into making water. Let's check in with Tom to hear more about his experience in space. Welcome to the Science Mill. This is astronaut Tom Hendricks. And I was told I needed to wear a mask because of COVID-19. Actually, I'm joking. So I'm not wearing the mask because of the virus. I just wanted to show you what a pilot's helmet and mask look like that I had to wear before I became an astronaut. So my name is Tom Henricks. I grew up on a small farm outside a small town in Ohio, not much bigger than uh, Johnson City, as a matter of fact. And I went to the Air Force Academy, joined the Air Force after I graduated and became a, a pilot and then a test pilot. And after becoming a test pilot, that made me uh, competitive to become an astronaut because they wanted pilots for the space shuttle. I tried four times before they finally selected me. So my message there is don't give up on anything. It takes persistence to make your dreams come true. I wanted to show you a few things from my experience 
The first one is going to be a video of launch of the shuttle. And I'm going to share my screen now. So here is the launch of a shuttle. It's a four and a half million pound vehicle when it's sitting on a launch pad. And the engines that are on the back of what looks like an airplane are going to start in sequence. And then when they're up to full thrust, then the two white rockets on the side of that brown tank will light. And I'm going to show you what it's like from inside the cockpit during the launch. Here we go. There's liftoff. We're already going 120 miles an hour. Houston, Columbia is in the roll program. Roger, roll, Columbia. Beautiful view. Above the clouds. We're burning fuel at the rate of 12 tons every second. Okay, so I went down. One. We went faster than the speed of sound in less than a minute. A little bit higher, Max Q. That shock wave is behind the window, so we don't see it. And that's because we're going supersonic. DC. That's our music guy. Good riddance. 103, 103. Those big rockets separate. They go around the horn. And they go back to the ocean and reused. Temps are coming down. Four minutes going around the horn. Columbia, yeah, negative return. Negative return, you said. It's a much smoother ride now. Columbia, performing nominal. Nominal performance. Turn your soda tour off and you can raise your visors. Now we're pulling three Gs, accelerating at three times the force of gravity, and that string kept the uh, checklist from hitting the person behind me. Here the engines are about to shut off. At Mach 25, engines hitting the clock. Welcome to space, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah! 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 So that's what it's like to launch on the space shuttle. In eight and a half minutes, we went from zero to 17,500 miles an hour. Imagine 17,500 miles an hour. So it's the same thing as going five miles in a second. Imagine going from San Antonio to Austin in just a few seconds. And that's how fast we're traveling. And that's why we fall around the earth. If you could take a ball and throw it, you know, as hard as you can, you might be able to throw it a few yards, maybe 50 yards if you're really strong. But if you could throw that ball 17,500 miles an hour, it would go all the way over the horizon and continue to fall around the Earth. And that's what satellites are doing. Uh, I wanted to show you a few other things. So let me uh, show you the crews that I flew with. I'm going to try and uh, do this over my shoulder. Let me unplug the computer first. There we go. These are the guys that I flew on my first mission with, and it was commanded by the first African-American to command a space vehicle, and that's the fellow in the front row beside me, Fred Gregory. This was the second crew I flew with, and you'll see there were two uh, Germans with me. Germany actually uh, sponsored the flight and put two of their astronauts on board, and we carried 80 experiments, and then got to go visit Germany afterwards, so that was pretty cool. Uh, the next crew I flew with is uh, this one. Oops, there we go. And the, so the guy that's uh, on the right-hand side of the picture now lives outside Blanco near me. So there's actually three astronauts in Blanco now. And he and I flew together again on this mission, which was my last one in 1996. And you can see I had uh, women on uh, two of my crews, and that was a great experience. And in the future, 
there are more and more women participating in the space program. So I want you young ladies to make sure that you don't rule that out as something you can do. It's uh, an opportunity that anyone can do. I also want to share the screen again and show you just a couple pictures from inside the shuttle. So here's the shuttle again just after launch. As I mentioned, it's a four and a half million pound vehicle when it's on the launch pad and seven million, pound, seven million pounds of thrust pick it up from the launch pad and that's what you see in this scene. And that is the most exciting and also the most dangerous part of the mission. It's not all work in space. This is one of the German astronauts. He's floating inside our laboratory, which was carried in the back of the shuttle. And the back of the shuttle is about the size of a school bus. Imagine a school bus going to space with us. And that's essentially what we had, but it was filled with experiments. And here is a gentleman named Ulrich Walter, a very German name, uh, floating in zero gravity like he's Superman. We also try and exercise in space, but here's one of the challenges without gravity, exercising. So this is Rick Lenahan. He's actually the first veterinarian to spend time in space. And he has his toes tucked underneath some straps that are on the floor. And then he put an elastic strap over that gold bar you see running behind him. And he's doing pull-ups with that elastic strap in an effort to get some exercise. The device that's on his left leg on his thigh is a communication device so he could punch one button and talk to the ground and another button to talk to the cockpit of the space shuttle. And the reason he has his toes tucked under those foot loops is without gravity, if he pulled on that strap, he would just pull himself up to the ceiling. So you have to, uh, if you want to stay in position, put your toes underneath a, a strap. And notice he has no shoes on. We don't really use our legs much in space and shoes become a hazard because you might bump something and not realize it and, and flip a switch, which could be dangerous. The other thing I wanted to show you on this picture is right here, this silver uh, container is actually his water. We have to be careful about not becoming dehydrated in space. And on the end of it here, you can see the straw. And the very end of that straw has a clip on it. The reason we have a clip there is if we didn't, the juice or water that's in that container would float out and that could be dangerous because it could get inside some electronics or a computer inside the shuttle. Let me see what other picture we have. Oh, everybody always asks, how do you go to the bathroom in space? So let me try and explain this. Again, we don't have gravity. So the first problem is how do you stay on the toilet? Well, it was very ingenious. Here on this side, you can barely see part of a handle. Over here on the other side, you can see it much more clearly. It's got a pad. So what we would do is pick up both those handles and then rotate them over so this padded white uh, section is on our thighs. And that would hold us down onto the seat so we could hit the hole. This is not very big. And once we were in position, then we moved this gear shift lever and that opened the trap door under the seat and caused airflow to space because space is a vacuum. So it provided easy airflow and that kept all the odors and dries out the waste that goes into this container. And of course, all the waste that goes in there uh, comes back to earth because it'd be dangerous if we left it out in space. So the other thing we have to do is, uh, you know, urinate and that's uh, the tube that the urine would go down. So each person has their own adapter, a connector that goes on to this tube, and then that's what sucks in the liquid as you go to the restroom. The can here on top is where all the waste goes. We don't want to put toilet paper or tissues or anything down here because it's a small space. So we put those in this container. Again, you can see where air is being sucked there to keep the odors out and keep it dry, and then we compact that and bring it back to space. There's also a, um, see the, the towels and you can clean up in there. This area has a curtain around it. So if you needed to change clothes um, in a private environment or wanted to bathe yourself, this is where you could go to, to do that. 
Now you know how we go to the bathroom in space. And the shorter answer is very carefully. Okay, sleeping. Imagine trying to go to sleep without gravity. You don't have the comfort of lying on a mattress. You don't have that nice pillow holding your head up. And you don't have the comfort of a blanket lying on you. Imagine just trying to sleep floating in the middle of your room. It's not comfortable. So we would try and compensate for that by getting into this sleeping bag. You can see my arms are exposed because I've put my arms through the slots in the sleeping bag so I wouldn't slide out of it. And then I've pulled my legs up and I'm holding them up in kind of a fetal position with uh, that elastic strap. And that was to relieve back pain due to the fact that I was taller. When you first go to space, your uh, spine expands, and it does the same thing when you sleep in bed at night. You're actually the tallest that you're going to be during the day when you first wake up and get out of bed. But gravity squishes you back to your normal height. In space, we don't have that squishing gravity, so our spines remain longer, which means we're taller, and that causes muscle stress. And then I've got my arms strapped in as well, and that's so they don't float out. If I was asleep without my arms strapped down, they'd float out at 90 degree angles, then it would just be easier for someone to bump into me and wake me up. And you can see I have a pillow strapped to the back of my head with this elastic strap. Well, if I want to roll over, so now I'm sleeping on my back, if I wanted to roll over on my stomach, all I do is take that pillow and rotate it around in my forehead, and that would give me the sensation of I just rolled over. Again, not very comfortable to sleep. We have a wonderful sensation of how fragile the Earth is when we first get, go to space. I wish everyone could see it. This is the atmosphere from the space shuttle with the sun just setting over a thunderstorm. That thunderstorm is probably 50,000 feet high. And then you can see the white and the blue area, which is still atmosphere, but you double that, triple that thunderstorm above 150,000 feet or so, there's not a lot of air up there. And this is very thin compared to the size of the Earth. And that's all that's protecting us from that harshness of space. We couldn't survive without the atmosphere. So in reality, you're astronauts now. We're on a spaceship called Earth, flying through the vastness of space, and this atmosphere is what keeps our, um, our spaceship safe. Let's take one look out the window. Here is Italy. You can see that coming down from Europe. I think it's a very familiar scene. There's the boot, you know, the heel and the toe, and the toe's kicking Sicily. And this is the Mediterranean Ocean. And that's what it looks like. 200 miles up is where the space shuttle and the space station uh, generally are orbiting. And that's roughly what you can see without a telescope or binoculars. Okay, you know, I flew during the space shuttle era. In the 80s, 90s, and even into the 2000s, we flew the space shuttle. It was a reusable shuttle. You just saw uh, what that was like. But it was not very safe. We had two accidents, one in 1986 and another one in 2001. The crews lost their lives and it proved that the shuttle was not very reliable or very safe. So we kept flying it until we finished the space station because some of those pieces that are up there now as part of the space station were too big to go up in any rocket. They had to go on the space shuttle. So once those components were up and connected, the space shuttle was retired and that was in 2011. So how do people go back and forth to the space station now? Well, we rely on buying seats on a Russian spacecraft called Soyuz. It carries three people, and we normally have uh, six people up on the space station, and that varies between two to four Americans, usually a couple of Russians, and then all the European and Japanese countries that participate also put their astronauts up there, including Canada. And they rotate out about every six months. The record's been just over a year, and to me, that's an awful long time to be away from home. So uh, 
once the shuttle stopped flying and, and now that we're relying on the Russians to go into space, NASA can focus on going back to the moon and Mars. And that's where they're spending their efforts. But they contracted out to other companies and the two big winners were SpaceX, you probably heard of, and Boeing, a big airplane company. Both of them have now made uh, rockets and spaceships that will take people to the uh, International Space Station, and that begins next month in May. We'll have the first launch of NASA astronauts on a SpaceX, SpaceX capsule. And once that test flight has proven that it's safe to go to the station, many others, including civilians, can go up on, on those vehicles. So that's how we're going to continue to support the space station probably for another 10 years max, and then it will be taken apart and uh, re-entered, it'll essentially be destroyed by the atmosphere. So the next big thing is going to the moon. Artemis is the name of the program that NASA has developed to send people to the moon. They've already got the space ship, the capsule built. It's like a big Apollo capsule and the rocket's being tested now. They're trying to launch that in 2024 and the next person to step on the moon, NASA decided will be a woman. So that again will happen roughly around 2024, but you'll still be in school most likely. So what's your opportunity? Well, Mars is going to be visited by humans in the 2030s. You have the opportunity to be the first person to step on Mars. And I'm envious. Wow, wouldn't that be great? And the way you start that is, is doing things like you're doing now studying math, science, engineering, and technology subject in school, and being interested in things like the Science Mill and what they've got to offer. Uh, some of the questions that I got I'd like to address now. Uh, one of them was, have I recorded any uh, records in space? Well, I was the first pilot to log over a thousand hours in the space shuttle, but somebody else has now logged more. And I was also on the longest space shuttle mission back in 1996. We were up for more than 18 days. Well, the next year, somebody spent a little more time up in that. So yeah, I had a couple of records. They've both been beaten and I'm okay with that. I hope all the records that are currently uh, set are, are beat in the future. The next question was, do you really uh, feel like a feather in space? Well, no, it's not really like a feather because the air doesn't move us around. Uh, when I showed you those pictures, I kind of described what it was like to you know, live up there, go to the bathroom and sleep. But um, the biggest th difficulty was, was sleeping. And zero gravity is comfortable once you realize that you move with gentle motions, pushes with your hands. There's no reason to push hard. You might hurt yourself when you bounce off the other wall. So again, it's not really like being a feather, but it's, it's unique. And if you've ever dreamed about floating or flying, that's what it's like, but you're doing it for real. Uh, was it scary to be launched? Yes. So when I got there, we'd already had the Challenger accident. And you probably uh, know that a school teacher uh, lost her life on that. And I flew about um, three missions, four missions after we started flying again, and it was a night mission. And uh, of course, my family was concerned about it. Uh, as an astronaut, you're prepared. Uh, you know that everybody's doing their job and you're pretty confident, but still you say a prayer before you launch and, and you're thankful when you do get to space. Um, so I wouldn't say it was scary. As a fighter pilot, we didn't say we were scared, but we were apprehensive. Um, another question I heard was, uh, was the moon landing real? Well, I can <laughs> testify it was because I've seen the pictures that were brought back. I've seen the ro rocks that were brought back and I've talked to uh, eight of the gentlemen that had the opportunity to, to uh, go there on your behalf. And the other thing is, if you look at the movies and pictures that were uh, broadcast from the moon, the shadows that were there could not have been done uh, if it was faked on a uh, blue screen or or in a studio? Oh, that's a great question. Can plants grow in space? So they can't grow by themselves just 
if they were, say, on a rock in space. They need some atmosphere and they need some moisture. So they have to be on a planet like Earth where we have the energy from the sun that's just right. We have the air that protects us. We actually have magnetism that protects the radi protect us from the radiation that might cause us not to be able to survive here. And then, of course, we have water. So those things uh, are necessary. And one of the things that hopefully you'll get to answer is, were plants or even animals living on Mars? We can't find any evidence, solid evidence yet. We have things that look like and indicate there was at least water there. So maybe there was some atmosphere that supported life as well. So I hope you can answer that one when you get the chance to go to Mars. And in uh, ending, you may not want to go to Mars. I would have loved to go to Mars. But if you want to do anything related to science or space or engineering, now's the chance to keep working on it. Find what you're passionate about. I loved flying, and that's what got me into space. You might love the engineering or the math or biometrics. Find what really excites you. Become the best in that field. It'll be fun for you because you enjoy it. And if that skill or talent or knowledge is needed in space, you'll be the likely candidate. And even if you don't get to go, you'll enjoy the rest of your career because you're passionate about what you're doing. Thanks for the time today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Hope to see you at the Science Mill soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tom, for sharing your expertise with us. The Science Mill is home to some rockets, though they are considerably smaller than the ones you see lifting off on TV. These rockets are actually designed and built by high school students as part of the NASA Student Launch Initiative. The competition encourages students of all ages to create rockets that complete challenges while gathering data. When launched, these rockets were the largest ever engineered for the program. They reached an altitude of one mile high before coming back down. If you're fascinated by space, be sure to check out the Hill Country Space Expo coming this September, hosted by the Rayford Family Foundation. This expo combines hands-on activities for the whole family with panel discussions featuring experts on space exploration. There are many ways to find a career amongst the stars. Chemistry is one field of study that is utilized in many different ways aboard spacecraft. Chemical engineers examine how the physical components of rockets, shuttles, and probes react to interstellar forces, temperatures, and substances. If you want to become an astronaut yourself, there are a variety of different career paths you could follow. Many astronauts are chemists, doctors, pilots, and computer scientists. The broad requirements NASA sets when recruiting for a new class of astronauts are 1. Be a U.S. citizen 2. Have a master's degree in a STEM field 3. Have two years of professional experience 4. Be able to pass a NASA physical If you feel rockets in space are your calling, there are a bunch of ways you can get involved while still in school. Joining a robotics club Participating in science and maker fairs and pursuing internships will all help you understand where your STEM strengths lie and what a career in space could look like for you. Space is vast, and just like the cosmos around us, so are the opportunities to get involved in STEM careers that can take you to the stars. Thanks for joining us. That's all for this week. Remember, check out the Explorer Zone tab on our website for more information on all the activities on this week's episode.